Good morning, everybody, and welcome. And uh, a warm welcome to those who've turned up. And there would have been a warm welcome for those who have probably been told not to turn up. Um, uh, I'm going to hand over in just a second to uh, Nigel Farage, who's the um, uh, leader of the European, co-leader of the European and Freedom of Democracy Group, who's very kindly sponsored this meeting today. Um, on my right, I have uh, Professor Begas. You'll be familiar with his book, um, which, is, uh, which is a fabulous insight into the euro. On my left, I have Professor Hankel. You might be thinking, just a minute, is anybody up here not a professor? Uh, everybody seems to be a professor except myself. I'm a f retired financial economist. The difference between me being a professor or not being a professor is I had to be right when I was an economist, otherwise I didn't get paid. If you're a professor, of course, your salary comes up with the rations. I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to Nigel to introduce our very distinguished speakers. Well, Godfrey, thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. And I don't think this conference could possibly have been better timed, uh, given the news and given the ongoing debate. Uh, and I'm very pleased that the Parliament didn't decide to ban us from having this event. So, you know, perhaps there is just an element of democracy still left in this institution. I have been, over the last few years, repeatedly asking the question of uh, Mr. Barroso and, in more recent times, of my very good friend, Herman Van Rompuy, and I keep asking the question, what is plan B? What contingency plan are you putting into place uh, for countries, especially countries like Greece, but more generally, what alternatives are you preparing if this thing goes horribly wrong? And of course, the response is the same every time. They keep telling us there is no plan B. Now come to the point of view, I actually believe them. I don't think they have got a plan B, because as we know from the very start, the euro was a political project. It was seen to be that vital step towards creating a United States of Europe, and they didn't think ever, once in their little minds, that anything could possibly go wrong. Well, uh, there are one or two of us in this room who predicted from the very start that this would be a disaster, and indeed, this was the issue that got me into politics in the first place, believing that countries as diverse as Greece and Germany could not live and work together inside an economic and monetary union. But now is not the moment for uh, Mr. Bloom or myself uh, to sit here and say, I told you so. That wouldn't achieve anything. Now is the moment for us, as the really good Europeans, and I mean that, I mean that, because what happens in every country in Europe matters. And I think that democracy is under threat, in some of our European countries, certainly economically, uh, we appear to be on the brink. And so what this conference today is about is about a constructive engagement, is preparing an argument and looking at alternatives for when inevitably some countries have to leave the Eurozone. And so we're very, very pleased, delighted to have two distinguished speakers uh, to come and join us today to try and kick this debate off. Firstly, uh, Professor Wilhelm Hankel, who I shared a platform with in Berlin last year. Uh, he was one of the four German professors that took the court case to Karlsruhe, um, arguing that the bailouts were in fact in direct contravention of the treaties. Um, I'm convinced that you were right. Um, unfortunately, your court uh, didn't quite say that. I suppose if they had, it would have brought the German government down. Uh, but they did win some very significant concessions that you know, future bailouts would have to go uh, before the German Parliament, and we're delighted to have you here today. And we also have Professor Philip Baggers, who has written extensively on this subject, um, recently published a book, um, and I think uh, could be described um, as one of the few people in Europe actually preparing some radical thought on this subject. So, gentlemen, we are absolutely delighted to have you both here today. I'm sure... Uh, you're going to be met with an absolute barrage of questions when you've finished. I hope the meeting goes well, and I hand you back to the very competent, I'm sure, chairmanship of Godfrey Bloom. Thank you. Just to make sure that the interpreters are on the ball, I want everybody to bear in mind that fine words butter no parsnips. Get your heads around that one, interpreters, if you can. <laughs> be interested to see your interpretation later. Um, 
Can I hand over to Professor Hankel uh, to kick the ball off? And, uh, and uh, I'm sure we're going to learn a lot this morning. I know I am, and uh, I'm in the game. Professor. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, not only for the light, but for invitation. And thank you, Mr. Farage, for the chance to speak to this celebrity audience. It's a unique occasion for me also to polish my little bit rusty English, and I hope interpreters can help me sometimes if it is needed. Ladies and gentlemen, the mess about Euro and its future couldn't be greater. What type of crisis we are confronted? It is a crisis of currency, a crisis of states, a crisis of banks. I think this question can be answered in another way. First of all, in the reported monetary history, so since 3,000 years, there is no case, no case reported that currencies destroy states or banks. It is the opposite. It is the opposite. If states and banks not follow the rules uh, of the currency, then they come in the situation of failing. Therefore, and from this you can derive the real reason for this crisis is lying, first of all, in the states and the banks themselves. They could have a good chance to accept the rules. The rules are known since the beginning, the very beginning. But we have another devil in the play, so to speak, a Mephistopheles, if you accept German literature. And this is the European Central Bank, the ECB, because only a central bank is responsible for the stability of a currency. Only the central bank. Therefore, all the other pillars and columns in the treaty for the uh, stability of the euro, the articles of the uh, Treaty of uh, Amsterdam, or the no bailout clause, are more or less superfluous. Superfluous. They are an auxiliary element which was in principle not needed for stability, because no inflation can happen without printing money. And if uh, a central bank is follows its lines, inflation cannot uh, threaten a currency. But the real hardcore of this crisis lies in the policy of the ECB to support states and banks in their own self-inflicted problems. Nobody is saying this, but I explained uh, to our constitutional court in the complaint Mr. Farish was mentioning, we would never had a euro crisis, never, without the rescue plans of the, uh, the so-called rescue plans of the euro, because without all this superfluous support for quite other reasons, it is done. All the countries in crisis, near bankruptcy now, like Greece, uh, but all the other, would have forced to follow another policy. Without support, Greece, for instance, a year ago, was forced to opt out of the Euro uh, uh, Union, of the Eurozone. It had to come back to the situation ex ante, to the situation before, to the old but now new currency, its drachma. And having done this, there would be internally 
a different strategy from externally. Internally, there would happen an exchange one-to-one -one between Euro and Rachma in order to avoid any conflict with the population, with the economy, and any urge for compensations. But externally, Greece would have forced to devalue, devalue the new old uh, currency. And this gave or had given Greece a wonderful pistol to put it on the breast of the foreign creditors, namely to say you have the choice now to get a little bit or nothing or more. Because any country having an own currency, being autonomous in monetary terms, uh, has the right to stop transfer payments to abroad. And this right, this very old right of any sovereign state, not separating state and currency, this works in the reported monetary history let's say 3,000 years, at least 1,800 times. 1,800 times uh, states near bankruptcy uh, argumented to the foreign creditors, we have to devalue and you have to offer us a haircut. And all creditors accepted this deal because getting something is always a little bit more than nothing. And if you look to the newer history, monetary history, so to the cases of Mexico, Argentina, <coughs> Russia, Ukraine, you see the same pattern. Those countries devalued, got a haircut, and the defender of this haircut was the IMF, <coughs> taking the lead in all those negotiations, held in the prepared uh, negotiation clubs of Paris and London. And also the argument those haircut countries are losing their reputation and their credit on the foreign market is not true, because all the mentioned countries, Argentina, Russia, uh, Ukraine, are now the best clients uh, on the financial markets. So the memory of the financial markets for those countries is fortunately not too long. It's lasting not forever. So this would be the scenario in case uh, European uh, Union and uh, European uh, nations had not decided to rescue, to rescue the euro. Therefore, I said it was completely not only superfluous, it was counterproductive. Now we have the mess. And we never would uh, had the mess without those rescue uh, schemes. But in order <coughs> to understand this problem a little bit better, let me structure the next uh, parts of my speech in two parts. First, how could it happen? What are the reasons for the situation now? And secondly, what can we do to come out of this uh, situation? <coughs> so if we go back to the, so to speak, prehistory of the Euro, <coughs> 10, 11 years ago, then we see it with the international treaty, or you can say with the stroke of a pen, the whole group of South European countries having since hundreds of years weak currencies got a standing and a creditworthiness they never had. And this uh, was leading to an enormous, to an enormous ah, historical fall in the interest rates. So I remember even before the treaty was signed, the Treaty of, of uh, Maastricht, interest rate in countries like Greece, Italy, Spain, were in the neighborhood of two decimal, 15 to 18 percent per annum. 
but the merely anticipation of their entry in the euro gave them interest rate coming from two decimal to one decimal uh, uh, levels, practically to the German level of then six to seven percent. This was a tripling in most cases for the whole group, a tripling. And what was the consequence of this uh, tripling in interest rate and losing uh, their risk premia on the financial market? They started with the policy of negative interest rate and of negative real foreign exchange rates. From one, by the way, uh, last week uh, some group of economists uh, received the Nobel Prize rewarding. But the best, the best uh, confirmation for this policy is their statement of rational behavior. It was from the side of those countries rational behavior in a short time view. Maybe rational behavior for policymakers looking only to the next election. Uh, date to start with a policy of expansion in the home economy financed by foreign, cheap foreign credits. The other side of this policy was quite uh, uh, normal. If you import money and credits, you produce inflation. And this happened. And you produce not only inflation, you produce uh, produce very, very heavy, heavy deficits in current account and you accumulate your foreign debts. Everything happened according to the textbooks. According to the textbooks and the warnings of some economists of United States, of Germany and even of my colleague on my right side. It happened. <coughs> and now with break, break out of the Greek crisis, autumn 29, the markets woke up. They came back to the original function, which is to value risks. To value risks. They uh, <coughs> realized the big, big risks within the union, the old equation of the union in Greek uh, euro is equal to a German euro or Netherlands euro. This equation never was valid. Greek, in the 10, 11 years of the euro, accumulated inflation, debts, foreign debts, and an enormous rise in wage unit costs. Over 70% in 10 years in comparison with nearly 1% uh, with the leading economy in, in, in the Union of Germany. So this relation, 70 to 1, it's, it's a simple e explanation for what happened in Greece and still happened, uh, do happen in, 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 in Greece. They lost their, competit their competitiveness. And having lost competitiveness, according all textbooks, there is only, only, and one way out, you have to devalue. The question is what you have to devalue, your wages or your currency. And one of the greatest economists, at least in my view of the last century, Milton Friedman, <coughs> made the famous sentence repressed by nearly all politicians in, in Europe, except Mr. Farage. It is much easier to change one price of the currency, namely the foreign exchange rate, than to change all prices, entire prices altogether. So if a big group of European, of Euro countries is losing the capacity and the capability to devalue, then they have only one option <coughs> to devalue internally the wage, union, the wage unit costs. 
And this means not only deflation, this means a catastrophe. This means a political, domestic catastrophe. And not only <clears throat> for the debtor countries, not only for Greece, but for the creditor countries too. Because a debtor country <clears throat> living under conditions of an internal real devaluation, namely cutting incomes, increasing uh, taxes, uh, cannot uh, realize economic growth. So, consequently, we see now a big, big <coughs> break in economic prosperity and growth in Greece, a minus in GDP of at least this year 5% and maybe the next year a uh, little bit more. <coughs> in such a situation, of course, creditors have to fear what happens with, with, with our assets. So it is neither in the interest of the debtor country to devalue really, nor in the interest of the creditor countries to do it or to ask for it. I think it is one of the most destructive and contraproductive uh, policies we ever had since the 30s to combine the so-called support with a strong, strong deflationary policy in the uh, data country. We in Germany have the most terrible memories on such a policy, namely the time before Hitler came. In those days, 1932, a German uh, chancellor Heinrich Brüning, not very well educated in Keynesian economics because Keynes was not published in those days, uh, <coughs> accepted for Germany a deflationary policy in order to convince creditors, creditors of Germany in those days Germany could not repay old debts from the war. And he cut it incomes by 6%, and the result in few 18 months from summer 31 to uh, spring 33 was an increase in unemployment up to 6 million people, which was more or less 27% of the whole uh, workforce. This memory in mind, it is un understandable that even Germany, German politicians of today, are asking for strong conditions for the support for Greece and the other in terms of deflationary policies. This can end only in the ungovernmentally of those countries and, re and, and coming to the same problems in the north of the Mediterranean Sea, or oh no, in the south of the Mediterranean Sea, as we had in north. So south Europe <coughs> is following the foot uh, spurs of north, north of Africa. People in the young people in the market places and the streets of Athens or Madrid or maybe Rome next time, <coughs> have the same problems or similar problems as the people on the coast of uh, north of Africa, of Libya, Egypt, or even uh, Syria. <coughs> Only the origins are different. In Europe, they are self-fabricated and against any wisdom of economists. This is the curious situation. <clears throat> so it brings me to the second time of my speech, what can be done to come out of this mess. <clears throat> First of all, we have to convince politicians what they are doing. And I am happy to have, a, to can have here deliver a small contribution to that, with your help, of course. 
all the money needed or accumulated in the next months and years for support, the euro, all the money would be much better and in a more constructive way could be used for helping those countries not to save but to invest, to bring them out of the existing bottleneck in their economic stagnation. And you can ask <coughs> why the simple truth is so not accepted by politicians as well as <coughs> in the uh, public and published opinion. And here we have to look to the main creditor countries. In Germany, we have since long time the situation of a nation which uh, is not accepting to being a nation. Germany, after war, came out after the catastrophic of this end of the war, not as a nation, <coughs> but as a society of merchants. A society of merchants, economic, economic miracles, and the hard <coughs> and strong Deutschmark, the DM, when the new symbols of the nation not their own history, not their own tradition, but economic goals and aims. And the most popular politician in Germany in those days was not Konrad Adenauer, but Ludwig Erhard, promising golden years for the German people uh, if they are working hard, having a strong currency. And he was right. But what he could not foresee, and it was impossible to, to forecast it in those days, the mentality <coughs> of a merchant nation is becoming more and more lobbyistic. And what we see in Germany is a mixing of lobbyistic arguments for the euro uh, with macroeconomic arguments, which is, of course, uh, a very dangerous and not a very wise uh, attitude. <coughs> the biggest industry in Germany, the two biggest industry in Germany, export sector and financial industry, of course, are fearing an collapse of the euro. Quite sure. And the export sector is fearing additionally not a collapse of the euro, but an appreciation of the Deutschmark if we come back to national currencies, saying it would be a hard uh, stroke against the Germans, Germany's export performance. Sometimes I have the feeling my compatriots have no short-time memory, because I myself, in my youth, was preparing for my boss, the, then, the legendary economics minister Karl Schiller, I don't know, two or three revaluations of the Deutschmarks. And before any step in revaluating the Deutschmark, we had the uh, noise of the export lobby it is a catastrophe for the German export sector. And after each, each appreciation of the, of the Deutsche Mark, we saw the opposite was true. The German export surpluses began to rise more and more. And the explanation is it's very simple. <clears throat> there is, I think, no big export nation, neither China or United States, having such an impact, such an impact of pre-perfect items for the export. At least 50% about of the typical export product of Germany have to be imported in form of raw materials, in form of energy, in form of uh, other pre uh, done products. 
And the explanation why Germany survived any uh, um, revaluation of the Deutschmark was very simple. The cheap import of the uh, inputs, the cheap import was strengthen the competitiveness of the German export sector. So Germany profited from uh, the uh, revaluation, and this not only in the export sector, throughout the whole economy. <clears throat> Any appreciation of the Deutschmark was, so to speak, a social dividend for the German people, a social dividend, getting more for the money and having uh, cheaper, not only bananas, but also petrol and all the other things the people needed. But this is forgotten now. Now, from uh, the big industries, as well as from the government, publishing media, take over the wrong philosophy. We cannot come back to the Deutschmark because we would lose our export position our export strengths, which is not true, but is believed. And a quite similar situation we have in France, but here it is not the export lobby, but the financial lobby, saying if there is a haircut, and there seems to be, it is a must to get into a haircut, so uh, it will come or will lead us to a very dangerous situation in uh, surviving banks, in surviving banks, so to speak, a um, nuclear reaction in the financial sector is threatening. It is true, at least, I would say, before in the private law, somebody, enterprise, is announcing he is getting bankrupt, he has to manifest to open his balance sheets and uh, to accept uh, strong proof of his assets and his still reserves. But in case of banking, doesn't matter French banking or even German banking, bank uh, lobbyists are arguing we are in danger without any proof of the realities without opening a balance sheet. At least in my former time as a practical banker, I know what means still reserves. Some of our banks uh, have still assets, big assets in the books of German uh, big uh, industry they bought not in the last 50, but before 150 years. And all, all those uh, assets are written down up to one euro. So the real potential of still reserves has to be proved before it is believable, it is uh, manifest that banks cannot, cannot, doesn't matter in Germany or in France, to match losses from a Greek or let's say Spain haircut by 50%. It was not uh, very honorable for German banks some uh, <coughs> weeks ago to offer the government a haircut by about 21%. They would make a very good business by 21% if the real depreciation of assets is 50%. And, and they knew it. So we have to first to accept most arguments in favor of rescuing the euro by rescuing funds are only lobbyistic arguments, having no, no uh, <coughs> roots in macroeconomic analysis and in the real, in the real evalu evaluation of the situation. So I come to the conclusion, <coughs> stopping rescuing Plans for the euro, euro is one element, but switching off the, fee, uh, the means to investment purposes, like the old Marshall Plan, 
would be the best alternative for rescuing now Greece, Spain and the other countries be wearing them, saving them for a situation like the north of Africa. Holding uh, stability within uh, the Union. But these are only <coughs> measurements ad hoc. We have to look, and this is the uh, conclusion of the speech, we have to look to future. And for future, <coughs> we have to orient us maybe on two famous sentences very known to everybody <coughs> of us. The one it's very old and comes from United States President Abraham Lincoln saying, you can fool people, a part of people, a part time. And you can fool a part time people, maybe all, but you cannot fool all people all the time, <laughs> forever. Therefore, truth is the first uh, element of our common understanding and policy. We have to come back to the reality and to the truth in analysis. And here we come back to the other sentence of Milton Friedman. It is easier to change for every country in difficulties to change the foreign exchange rate than the entire economy. The entire economy is the catastrophe. And this is covered by our experience a set of 3,000 years of monetary history. There was never in this time, never, a monetary agreement on global level as well as on regional level which was going beyond a foreign exchange agree rate agreement. You can take what you want, Bretton Woods, the gold standard. Both very interesting and some decades, very uh, successful arrangements among our nations in the world economy, they agreed about uh, foreign exchange rates and the modus operandi to change them. But they never separated money and state, and they never abandoned the responsi responsibility of any state for their own currency. In the gold standard, we had national currency as well as in the Bretton Woods. And even the part-timely uh, successful monetary, uh, regional monetary agreements, like Nordic Mint Union of the Scandinavian countries, or uh, French-led uh, Latin Mint Convention of the years around the First War, they never separated uh, uh, money and state, and they regulated only the models of exchange rate changes. Therefore, the future <coughs> is to rebuild, to come back from the monetary union to a foreign exchange rate union. And this foreign exchange rate union is not a novum. It is still existing not in the central uh, European countries, but in the eastern parts of Europe. Poland, Baltic states, Hungary, Slovakia, Czech, they all have their own <coughs> national money. They are in the so-called uh, pre-room uh, for the euro, which means they have no euro. And they can change and they have changed. They changed the foreign exchange rate, and all of them mastered their crisis, the existing crisis, much, much better than the uh, countries of South Europe. So, the conclusion is, in one word, we have to unify the monetary system. We have to, to stop with the two-chamber uh, system, one in the Union, other out, and we have to unify them in a foreign rate exchange union as we had before the euro. And this would bring us back the golden years of Europe. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you very much, Professor. That was uh, extremely interesting. Um, I think we're going to get a rather different perspective from Professor Bacus in a minute on, that, on this, but uh, I'm going to ask you, if you'd be so kind, to save your questions to the end. I know there's going to be a lot of questions. I'm going to be quite disciplined about it. I'm going to want the questions short, pithy. I'm going to make the speakers give short answers, because there's going to be an awful lot of questions. I was in uh, Washington last year uh, as a guest of the IMF, funnily enough, and I was speaking to a, an illustrious academic, and I was giving my views, which are probably a little bit closer to Professor Bagus's uh, in a minute. Uh, and he said, Godfrey, that's all very well. Uh, that's all very well uh, in practice, but will it work in theory? Yeah, it takes a bit of thinking about. Um, so keep your questions. Write them down. I'm going to leave as much time as I can, as many questions as possible. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Professor Bagus now to give his side uh, of the argument, if you'd be so kind. Uh, and I think you'll find it equally interesting. Professor. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction by Mr. Bloom. Thank you for inviting me, Mr. Farage. Thank you for organizing, uh, Mr. Kelly, and thank you for you all uh, coming here. So European politicians still try to save the project of the euro. They design ever greater bailout packages. Along with the bailouts, there may be an economic government forthcoming. Uh, countries may give up parts of their sovereignty. So the ca character of the EMU may change forever. So while it is still unclear where future developments will lead the EMU, the costs and the risks remaining within the European Monetary Union are already immense and they are rising. So now is the moment to exit. So, but is it possible to exit? How to do it? What problems would have to be solved? This is what I am going to talk about. So let me first address shortly the costs of the euro. The euro is a misconstruction, as I explain uh, in my book, the tragedy of uh, the euro, because in the eurozone there are fiscally independent sovereign governments coexisting with one central banking system. And this is a unique construction, as normally there is one government with its own banking system. Governments, governments can finance their deficits through the banking system and money creation. When governments spend more than they receive in tax revenues, they typically issue government bonds. The financial system buys then these government bonds by creating new money. And banks purchase these bonds because they use them as collateral for new reserves, new loans from the ECB. So new money flows to governments that monetize their deficits indirectly. And the cost of this monetization is borne by all users of the currency in form of a reduced purchasing power of the currency. If there is one government per central banking system, the whole nation bears the costs of the deficit's monetization. In the Eurozone, however, there are several governments running their own budgets. So imagine that all governments have a balanced budget. All governments but one. Then the one deficit government can externalize on other nations part of the cost of its deficit in form of higher prices. So, so a government like the Greek one with a high deficit prints bonds, government bonds bought and monetized by the banking system. As a consequence, there's a tendency for prices to rise throughout the monetary union. The, it means the higher deficit of a government in relation to the deficits of other countries is the more effectively it can externalize the costs of a deficit. So the, the incentives of the setup are explosive as governments benefit from deficits higher than the ones of their Eurozone neighbors. So the, stabi the stability and growth pact designed to contain these incentives utterly failed because governments uh, judge if sanctions are imposed on themselves. One effect of this ill-fated setup is that it allows governments to maintain incompetitive economic structures like inflexible labor markets, huge welfare systems, and public sectors for a very long time. And through the deficit spending, the size of government increases. There's also a tendency for price inflation to finance deficits. And the ECB has to take a highly inflationary stand to maintain 
to save this, pol this political project of the hero. The system thereby causes the over-indebtedness and incompetitiveness typical for the recent sovereign debt crisis. And the sovereign debt crisis in turn has triggered a tendency towards centralization of power in Brussels. The existing monetary transfer union causes a sovereign debt crisis that brings us now closer to a more explicit transfer, transfer union. The possible European economic government or transfers through eurobonds are only the result of the underlying and dangerous monetary transfer union implied in the institutional setups of the euro. And the centralization and increase in the state's uh, size comes along with the loss for liberty. Uh, we, move, we move towards socialism fast and hard. Uh, fiscal, harmonization, fiscal harmonization eliminates tax competition. So, sta so staying within uh, the UT EMU comes with an important risk for liberty. And finally, peaceful, co peaceful cooperation will be hampered due to the redistribution between states that now has become obvious and leads to conflicts, conflicts and the situation might, might escalate. Besides uh, these, these costs, they are already costs incurred by the open bailout subsidies and transfer, transfers. Hmm? The, in the incentives and mechanisms of the euro system led to excessive deficits and rising debts. The financial crisis of 2008 then led market participants to doubt the commitment of fiscally sounder governments and the ECB to bail out weaker governments. So would re Germany really be capable and willing to support peripheral governments? The rising, the rising yields of peripheral government bonds, the unsustainable fiscal situation and the unclear commitment led to the bailouts of Greece 1, 110 billion, Greece 2, 109 billion, Ireland 85 billion, Portugal 78 billion. So these bailouts total 392 billion and eventual, eventual losses are borne by taxpayers in the fiscally sounder countries. In addition to these bailouts, the uh, EFSF has been installed. Its size is to be 750 billion. Uh, German, the German part of the guarantees are 211 billion. And when other countries that are guaranteeing the sum get into fiscal difficulties, the German part will rise. And indeed, the size of the EFSF will not be enough. To effectively guarantee all peripheral debt, the fund has to be increased to 1.45 trillion, according to a report uh, from Bernstein. And as the guarantee of Italy and other peripheral countries are worthless, Germany would have then to guarantee 790 billion or 32% of GDP. And if France loses its AA rating, which will occur sooner or later, um, the German share would rise to 1.385 trillion or 56% of German GDP. That is almost 70,000 euros per man, woman and child. In addition, taxpayers are also indirectly on the hook through the engagement of the IMF. And at the same time, taxpayers may suffer losses from the bailouts undertaken by the ECB. And the ECB has bought, until the beginning of October 2011, more than 160 billion euros of peripheral government bonds. And for any losses, Germany's part is 20, 27%. Moreover, the ECB has accepted government bonds from peripheral countries as collateral. <coughs> And if a government defaults, it will probably take down with it a great part of its banking system that had bought its government bonds. So the banking system will then be unable to pay back the loans to the ECB, and the ECB will be stuck with the bailout, uh, with the collateral that are government bonds in default. Uh, the think tank Open Europe calculated in June 2011 that a Greek default of 50% would cost the ECB between 45 and 65 billion euros. And these sums have been rising since June 2011 and will rise in the future because peripheral countries keep running substantial deficits and the ECB keeps buying more bonds and peripheral bank banks increase their refinancing with the ECB. Another support for peripheral countries works through the Target 2 system. And there are credit and debit accounts within the euro system and it's national central banks that are not netted. So at the end of 2010, the Bundesbank, the German Bundesbank, had claims of 
326 billion, while peripheral countries had liabilities of 335 billion. This, the Target 2 system works the following way. Imagine that um, a Greek depositor transfers his money from his Greek bank to a German bank. As a result, the German bank reduces its refinancing with the Bundesbank, and the Greek bank increases its refinancing with the Bank of Greece. The Bundesbank earns then a claim against the euro system and the Bank of Greece a liability. In theory, these claims could be netted, for instance, for instance by transferring assets such as gold from the Bank of Greece to, it's very tempting, the hammer, to uh, transferring assets such as gold from the Bank of Greece to the Bundesbank. Yet these claims are never paid in the euro system and the balances continuously build up. So when the Greek bank finally defaults on its loans, the losses are shared by all central banks in the euro system and affect, affect ultimately, ultimately taxpayers and citizens. As we saw, the costs of the euro are already high and the risks are immense, and both costs and risks are increasing day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. So is an exit possible? Well, intuitively, the exit from the euro should be as easy as the entrance. Joining and leaving the club should be equally simple. Leaving is just undoing what was done before. Indeed, many popular articles discuss the prospects of an exit of countries such as Greece or Germany. However, other voices have rightly argued that there are, there are important exit problems. Some authors even argue that these problems would make an exit from the euro virtually impossible. So let me now address some of these problems. Well, first, there might be legal problems. The Maastricht Treaty does not provide for a mechanism to exit the EMU. So several authors maintain that an exit from the euro would constitute a breach of the treaties. In an ECB working paper from 2009, the author claims that a country that exits the EMU would have to leave the EU as well. As the Lisbon Treaty allows for secession from the EU, withdrawal from the EU would be the only way to get rid of the euro. Well, I'm not a lawyer, but the solution to this legal problem could be an exit from both EMU and EU with an immediate re-entering of the EU. Uh, in case of a net contributor to the EU budget, such as, such as Germany, the country would probably not face any problems to get immediately readmitted to the EU, if that is the purpose. In any case, the referral to the Maastricht Treaty when discussing the legal possibility of exit is intriguing, is intriguing because the Maastricht Treaty, especially the no bailout clause, has been violated again and again through the bailouts of Greece, Ireland, and Portugal, through the EFSF and the ECB, not to mention the plans to introduce euro bonds. Well, then there will be introduction costs. An exit from the euro may imply the issuing of a new national currency. This involves the cost of printing new notes, melting new coins, and changing vendor machines. Well, these costs might, uh, might be not negligible, but these are one-time costs that contrast with the continuing and increasing costs and risks for countries staying within the Eurozone. And these costs are not higher than the cost of introducing the Euro. And the cost for introducing the Euro were estimated in Austria being around 0.5% of GDP. Further costs or problems, trade losses. Some authors argue that European trade would collapse in the wake of a Euro exit because trade barriers would be re-erected. A recent EUES research paper comes up, therefore, with horrific costs for a Euro breakup. However, however I do not regard uh, such trade barriers very likely uh, for several reasons. First, such barriers would be an economic disaster for all involved parties and lead to a severe and long depression and a reduction of living standards. Second, uh, net contributors to the EU budget, such as Germany, could still use their contribu contributions to the budget as a nego negotiation card to prevent such barriers. And third, trade barriers are a blatant violation of EU treaties and forced tariffs could provoke severe tensions between nations possibly leading to war. 
Next problem, political costs. Sometimes it is maintained that an exit implies high political costs. Most importantly, an exit could trigger a dissolution of the euro and mean the end of the euro project. The disintegration of the EMU could endanger the dream of a federal European state. At least it would mean an important blow to the European project. It could mean the end of the EU as we know today. The EU could degenerate into a free trade zone. zone. Of course, for supporters of a free trade zone in Europe, these political costs imply immense benefits. The danger of a European central state would disappear for now. Procedural costs. New, new notes would have to be printed, new coins melted, automatic teller machines reprogrammed and computer codes rewritten. This takes time. The case of machines may not be tragic since during the transition period, uh, old machines may be in use without chaos. So a, pe a public parking with euro coins uh, would not bring the economy down as the euro coins continues to exist. The notes and coins problem has a fast solution because on both the countries, origin is visible. Coins have a specific um, country, uh, have a country specific image, and notes be a country specific letter. So in a German exit from the euro, all German coins and notes would be redenominated into the new currency and later gradually, gradually exchanged into new coins and notes. The most severe problem of a euro exit that, according to Barry Eichengreen, would pose un insurmountable barriers are capital flows when the exit is discussed in democracies. Uh, because this discussion in Parliament and decision-making takes time. And during this discussion, there would be capital flows. So we may distinguish between capital inflows and outflows. Let us first discuss the problem of capital outflows, such as in the case of an exit of Greece with no accompanying reforms. So if Greek senior politicians would seriously discuss an exit from the euro, Greek citizens may expect a sharp depreciation of the new drachma. Greek citizens will then transfer the euros held at Greek banks to accounts in other EMU countries. And they will probably not voluntarily turn in their euro notes to be exchanged into new drachma notes. Greek citizens may also acquire other countries, uh, other currencies such as Swiss, fr Swiss franc, US dollars, or gold to protect themselves from, de from depreciation. Uh, Greece co could be practically de drachmatized even before the introduction of the drachma. Uh, as a con consequence, the Greek banking system would get into liquidity problems and later solvency problems. Uh, Greece would probably be euroized as citizens would continue to trans tra transact in euros held outside Greek jurisdiction. This is a so-called problem of capital outflows. Yet these outflows are not a problem for ordinary Greek citizens. For them, these outflows are the solution to a problem, the, the problem of an inflationary national currency. And by the way, these outflows, capital outflows, are already occurring. The discussion in the Parliament of Greece would only speed up what is happening anyway. Well, the opposite reasoning applies when a more solvent country like Germany discusses the exit from the Eurozone. When people expect an appreciation of a newly, newly introduced currency, there would be capital inflow flows into Germany. So the money supply of euros within Germany would increase the money supply that would later convert it into a new currency. So prices of German assets, housing, stocks would increase in advance of the actual German exit in benefit to the current owners of such assets. Last problem, a banking crisis. Finally, there may be a negative feedback for the banking system after an exit, as there are most likely losses for, for, for banks. Eichengreen fears the mother of all financial crisis, another mother because 2008 supposedly was already the mother of all financial crisis. Due to the interconnectivity, it does not matter actually if Germany or Greece would leave the euro. 
if Greece leaves the euro and pays back its government bonds in a depreciated new currency or defaults outright on its debts, there will be losses for European banks that could get solvency problems. Similarly, similarly, if Germany in turn leaves the euro, the implicit guarantee and support to the euro system will disappear. The result may be a bank run and banking crisis in Greece and other countries. And this banking crisis may then negatively affect German banks. Uh, and the banking crisis would also affect negatively sovereigns due to uh, poss possible bank recapitalizations. Other countries may be regarded as possible defaulters or exit candidates, leading to higher interest rates on public debts. A systemic financial crisis infecting weak governments is likely. In fact, recently the IMF suggested that European banks fa face 300 billion euros in potential losses and urge banks to raise capital. Well, I have to emphasize that the problem of bank undercapitalization and bad assets, most importantly peripheral government bonds, does already exist in the EMU and will deteriorate even without an exit. So it is almost impossible to leave the euro without already rotten structures to collapse. Yet this collapse would have beneficial if, uh, bef uh, the bef beneficial effect of purging quickly unsustainable structures. Even if there are no exits from the euro, the banking problem exists and will have to be solved sooner or later. So potential bank insolvency should not be an argument against an exit. In the EMU, today, taxpayers, mostly German, and inflationary measures by the ECB are momentarily containing the situation. An exit would speed up a restructuring of the European banking system. And at this point, I would like to give the following recommendation for a solution to the banking crisis, because there are important free market solutions to the problem of bank insolvency. First, let, bank, let banks fail. Banks with unviable business models should be allowed to fail, liberating capital and resources for other, more important, more productive business projects. Second, a debt to equity conversion may put many banks on a healthy basis, and banks may, in addition, collect uh, private capital issuing equity. Such a free market reform without using taxpayers' money has the important advantages. But first, most obviously, taxpayers are not hurt. Second, unsustainable banking projects are resolved. The oversized banking sector would shrink to a more healthy and sustainable level. Third, no inflationary policies are used to sustain the banking system. And lastly, Moral hazard is avoided because banks are not bailed out anymore. Banks fail. Another problem for an exit, the problem of disentangling the ECB. Now, the euro system consists of the ECB and national central banks. The task of disentangling is facilitated because national central banks still possess their own reserves and have their own balance sheets. Uh, one author, Scott, actually argues that this setup may have been intentional because countries wanted to retain the possibility to leave the euro if necessary. If it's not, not necessary now, I don't know when. Only part of all EMU reserve assets have been pooled in the ECB. National central banks retain the ownership of these foreign reserve assets and transfer only the management of the reserves to the ECB. So in case of an exit, both the return of the contribution to the ECB's capital and the foreign assets transferred to the ECB had to be negotiated. Similarly, there is the problem of target two claims and li liabilities that I mentioned before. So if Germany would have left the euro in December 2010, the Bundesbank would have found on its balance sheet target two claims denominated in euro, amounting to 326 billion. If the euro then depreciated against the new DMARC, important losses for the Bundesbank would have been the result. As a consequence, the German government would have 
probably would have had to recapitalize the Bundesbank. If, in contrast, uh, Greece leaves the EMU, it would be less problematic for the leaving country. Greece would simply pay its liabilities to the ECB with the new drachma involving losses for the institution. Well, after addressing these problems, let me um, give you three different ways to leave um, the euro. First, a redenomination, a return to a national currency. In a complete redenomination, all contracts and debts within a country's jurisdiction are redenominated into a new currency. All notes and coins are gradually exchanged against new ones. And the redenomination rate could be one to one to make the transition easier. There are several practical ways to achieve such a redenomination. Well, the first option contains a, contains a discussion about the exit in Parliament. In the case of Greece, this would trigger an immense outflow of capital, as I mentioned before. And when redenomination finally comes, after intense democratic discussion, almost no money will be left to be converted into the new drachma. Greek citizens could just continue to use euros held at foreign banks for the bulk of their transactions. And indeed, these capital flows are already occurring. If Germany or a similar country discusses an exit, capital flows into Germany would be the case, reducing interest rates. In the extreme, almost all of the euro money supply would be held at German banks. A redenomination of these euros into the new currency would make then the Bundesbank effectively the new central bank of Europe, of the eurozone. People might then start using the new DMARC in their respective countries. Well, obviously, in order to prevent these capital flows, if you don't want them, uh, capital controls are needed. But this would be against European law and would hamper economic integration. So is there maybe a better solution than capital controls? Well, one possibility is a complete surprise. Overnight, uh, it's declared without discussion using emergency law. But obviously, this would be undemocratic. So is there even a better solution? Well, the, so, so, so my solution is a provisional redomination, which is an elegant way to prevent a, a democratic deficit and allow for an extensive debate on the decision to leave the euro, both in Parliament and the public, allowing even for a referendum. Huh? The existing government uses the emergency situation of the euro system we are in to justify a provisional redenomination of the currency. So on a weekend, the government could convene an emergency meeting of the parliament and vote for a provisional redomination. From this moment on, all contracts and accounts in, in the country are provisionally redominated into a new currency. For international transfers, banks would then open euro accounts besides the national currency accounts, and the central bank would exit the target two system. Then the provisional redomination would allow for a public debate and a referendum on the issue without disturbing capital flows. After the provisional period, the change would then be made permanent, or accounts and contracts are simply nominated into euro again. A second way to pull out of the euro, or at least its most harmful disadvantages, is the introduction of a new parallel national currency. The National Central Bank would exit the euro system and issue a new currency. National banks would refinance, them, refinance themselves with other EMU banks or get loans in the new currency from the National Central Bank. The National Central Bank could back the new currency with its gold reserves and other assets. For, for instance, Greece could sell public assets and buy gold to issue a gold-backed drachma. The Bank of Greece could even make a redemption promise into gold and introduce a 100% gold standard. And the government could, would then pay its government bonds in the new currency as well as, as its many public employees and in this way introduce the new currency. A third way to, uh, to pull out of the euro is currency freedom. Uh, the introduction of currency competition by abolishing all legal tender laws. So for many countries... Uh, 
currency freedom could mean an euroization in the be beginning, especially for small countries. People would simply continue to use euros. Only gradually, contracts denominated in Swiss, Swiss franc dollars or gold would gain market share. The currency competition option has following, the following advantages. First, the currency competition or currency freedom is an advantage in itself from an ethical point of view because individuals use the currency of, of their choice and are not forced to use an inflationary legal tender. Second, in the long run, the most stable currencies will survive in currency competition. Issuers compete in offering stable currencies. And third, currency freedom allows a country, presumably a small one, that could face difficulties to introduce credibly a stable new national currency, to exit the EMU and with it to avoid all losses resulting from engagement in the EFSF, ESM, or losses suffered by the ECB. And as is initially the euro would remain in circulation, there would be no rough disruptions. A disadvantage of this solution may be the initial eurization, because most likely the euro will be very inflationary in the next years to help financing the bailout governments and banks. So the exiting country would at least in the beginning suffer from imported price inflation and monetary redistribution. Now, accompanying steps to make an exit a success. Roll back the state. If, for instance, Greece would exit the euro today with no further reforms, the result would be disastrous. Greece would still run a gigantic structural deficit, maintain an enormous public sector, suffer from high taxes, too high wages, powerful labor unions, privileges of all sorts, and inflexible markets. People would simply sell the new currencies in New Drachma, possibly causing very high price inflation rates. Greeks would also run their banks to change the New Drachma into hard assets. Investors and entrepreneurs would flee the country, would leave the country. Private capital would follow. Interest rates would soar. Misery would be the result. So for an exit to be successful, successful it's essential that the new currency must, is expected to be less inflationary than the euro. In case of Germany, to its fiscal situation, competitiveness, and monetary transition, tradition, such an expectation would be easy to achieve. But even in the case of a German exit, then there will be a negative feedback to the German economy by the turmoil caused in foreign and financial markets by its very own exit. Therefore, reforms alleviating such a negative feedback should also accompany a German exit. And in the case of Greece, a successful exit would require much bolder action. So what steps to make an exit and success should be undertaken? First, initiate a banking and monetary reform. To prevent in inflation and bank runs, bank runs, it is essential to put the financial system on a sound base. A recapitalization of banks is necessary and inevitable even without an exit sooner or later. The free market solution to the undercapitalization problem was mentioned before. And a monetary reform would also help the transition to a new currency. A new currency could, for instance, be backed by the gold of the National Central Bank. Bank. The Greek government, for instance, could back all new drachma 100% with gold, making the drachma convertible into the metal. And by back backing all bank deposits 100% by gold, a bank run could be prevented. Second, eliminate the public deficit. By eliminating the public deficit, fears of monetization would be reduced. Because when a government keeps running high deficits, people think that the debt will be monetized sooner or later capital outflows would be the result. The elimina elimination of the deficit could attract foreign capital, reducing interest rates, and thereby smoothening the transition period. The reduction of government spending to reduce the deficit also promotes growth in the private sector and eliminates distortions and waste. It helps to win confidence into the new currency. Third, restructure old debt. 
Restructuring or defaulting on part of the old debt has several advantages. A diminution of existing government debts reduces the fear of monetization and thereby generates confidence into the new currency. It makes also future deficits more unlikely as the government, at least in the beginning, will have problems to issue new debt. So the, te the temptation for government to run deficits and to monetize them is reduced. Fourth, privatize. Privatization of public assets put assets into the hand, hands of the productive private economy. Privatizations thereby generate growth and reduce public expenditures. The number of public employees is reduced. In addition, the receipts can be used to lower the burden of public debts or buy assets such as gold to back the new issued currency. Capital of the public sector is set free for private projects. Fifth, deregulate. Deregulation allows entrepreneurs to engage in combinations of factors of production to satisfy consumer wishes that before were forbidden. The deregulation thereby stimulates innovations and growth. It makes resources available, smoothening the transition and helping with eventual, eventual banking and monetary reforms. Six, flexible, flexibilize. It is essential to flexibilize markets, especially the labor law market. Inflexible labor markets reduce growth and produce unemployment. Unemployment produces government expenditures in form of unemployment benefits. Uncompetitive countries such as Greece have compensated such unemployment with deficit spending absorbing the unemployed onto the public payroll. So without a labor market reform, an introduction of a new currency in Greece could be disastrous. A flexibilization would make the econ economy competitive, increase growth, and attract private capital necessary for the restructuring of the economy. It would also help with the privatizations, which will set free labor from the government sector that needs to find a job in the private sector quickly. And lastly, lower taxes. The lower taxes allow the economy to grow. Projects with higher taxes were unprofitable, that were unprofitable before, suddenly become profitable. So saving a capital accumulation is promoted. The lower taxes boost growth and attract capital necessary for the reforms and restructuring. So let me conclude. A famous essay by Frederick Bastiat is titled What is Seen and What is Not Seen. Bastiat emphasizes in this essay that we have to look not only on the more direct effects of an action, but also on the more long-term, more indirect less visible effects, and the same is true for an euro exit. We should not look at the obvious problem, not only look at the obvious problems such as step put cause, but also on the more hidden and long-term costs of remaining within the eurozone. Accordingly, today I try to make the immense costs of remaining within the euro scene and compare them with the problems of exiting. When a country exits the euro, there will be turmoil in the markets. There might be panic. There will be a banking crisis, which is very visible. Thus, an exit is generally feared because calamity is seen. Even though they are more hidden and less visible, the costs and risks of remaining within the euro are much higher. These costs do not only include the costs of the open bailouts and the guarantees for the rescue funds. Because the euro is a misconstruction, several independent governments can use can finance their deficits through one central banking system. The incentive is to run higher deficits than the other states of the EMU. And due to the incentives, there is an inbuilt tendency for price inflation. To save the euro, the ECB will have to be highly inflationary in the future. It will have to keep accepting and buying government bonds and finance the rescue funds. And within the EMU, the incentives to reduce deficit spending are diminished. There's a general tendency for the size of government to increase due to this inflationary deficit spending. More likely, only a centralization of some sort, like a fiscal union, will be able to save the euro at this point with its current members. So the growing size of government, the centralization, the move towards socialism, imply a loss for individual liberty for citizens. And the redistribution between European nations may finally cause conflicts and disturb the harmonious cooperation in Europe. 
The problems of an euro exit have been largely exaggerated. Introduction costs, trade losses, political costs, legal problems, procedural costs, problems with disentangling of the ECB, sometimes post important but no insurmountable problems. With accompanying measures and careful negotiations, these problems at the end are all manageable. And I mentioned three ways to exit the euro. First, a redomination of all contracts and deposits into a new national currency. Coins and notes bearing the national system are exchanged gradually into the new currency, prefer preferably at a one-to-one -one exchange rate. In order to prevent disturbing capital flows, a provisional redenomination allowing for de democratic discussion seems to be the most elegant way. Second, the issue of a new parallel national currency. This national currency may be backed by government and cent or central bank assets, preferably gold, and would compete with the euro. Third, currency competition. All legal tender laws are abolished. Gradually, citizens will start using more stable currencies and po possibly adopt commodity-based means of payment. It is essential to accompany an exit from the euro with supporting reforms to alleviate transition costs. The sovereign debt and euro crisis is for most a crisis of the state, a state that has grown to a dimension that threatens the stability of the currency. Accompanying measures must roll back the state. To introduce a new currency with success, it is essential that this new currency is expected to be less inflationary than the euro. So a banking reform will be necessary in any case. An exit from the euro should be used to thoroughly reform the banking and monetary system, putting them finally on a sound basis. It's maybe the most important uh, task for civilization to put the money and banking system on a sound basis. We should use the euro crisis to do that. Moreover, the public deficit should be eliminated, all public debt restructured, public assets privatized, markets deregulated and flexibilized and taxes lowered. If an exit from the euro is accompanied by these measures, it will be a great triumph for growth, peace and liberty in Europe. The alternative is stagnation, inflation, centralization and conflict. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> it's always wonderful to hear an expert make a long statement of the blindingly bloody obvious, but there we are. Um, I'm going to take questions. Um, can you keep your questions as brief as possible? And I'll ask the panel to be as brief as possible in their response, which isn't always easy. I understand that point. Um, so we'll get more in. Uh, I've, I've got 20 in front of me, so you, you must have plenty as well. So who'd like to start the ball rolling? Mr. Farage, if you might identify yourselves, we don't need Nigel to identify yourselves, but if you do have a question, it Thank would be you, nice Chairman. if you did. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, this new idea that the, the bailout fund is going to be geared up uh, with support by the ECB uh, to a sort of five times its current size, giving the new bailout fund the, the firepower of two trillion euros, and has been described by former Chancellor Norman Lamont in the British press this morning as nothing but a giant Ponzi scheme. Um, and I'd like to ask our panellists, do they agree <laughs> with uh, Lord Lamont's view? But in practical terms, you know, can this idea work? That's question number one. And question number two is we hear senior voices in Germany, you know, right up to the president, uh, being very deeply critical of all that is happening, uh, questioning uh, what is happening to German democracy itself, when are we going to see a political movement in Germany saying much the same thing? Because I, I don't at the moment see one. In Germany, the political scenery is changing very dramatically because the old bloc parties, so to speak, having no alternative to the European policy. We have a coalition between government and opposition. Governmental coalition as well as the coalition are following the same policies. This is not true with uh, the new movements. We have uh, two new, uh, new movements in Germany, free voters 
unfortunately only organized on a local and regional level, but for the next election they will come uh, with a list on a uh, central national level. And the second group is the, the most uh, enigmatic uh, group, the pirates, young people having no program. <laughs> but their program is we are against the established parties. And I think we have the older, the elderly have uh, to advise them now. And they have a good chance. They, they got an all polls and even an, an effective uh, uh, elections about 10% with rising trend. So it's a little bit too premature to answer your question, but I have hope with you the hope that we can give a better answer, let's say, before the next election uh, on a national level in Germany. Um, I would like to pick up on the first one, because I, as I don't live in Germany anymore. Um, I'm not so near to the political news. To the boosting of the EFSS is, uh, well, Ponzi scheme is basically printing money. You can, uh, it's more indirect way to do it. The ECB can just buy more peripheral government bonds. They don't want to do it. The way they, they pro this proposal works is uh, the ECB prints new money, gives it as a loan to the EFSF, and the EFSF buys or government bonds or, or gives loans to the, uh, to the governments. So it's just an indirect way, yeah. but it's financed by money production. Well, the difference is also that the losses, the losses of the EFSF then are the burden goes to the taxpayers in, in the guaranteeing countries. But probably these losses will not be paid by higher taxes. So if there's a loss for the EFSS of 10 billion, do you think Germany will raise taxes 10 billion? No. They will increase debts, issue more government bonds. And who will buy these? Well, banks. And banks will go to the ECB. The ECB will print more money. So at the end, it's just a more indirect way of money production to finance uh, uh, irresponsible governments and high deficits. I wonder if I might uh, ask a question myself here. I've, I've been looking for a, um, through the economic history books to see if um, ever a political dynamic can beat an economic dynamic. Does politics ever beat economics? Is there any historical precedent? We have in Unfortunately, only, I think, in the German uh, literature, a very famous essay, 100 years old, by one of the founders of the School of Vienna. You are not a little bit uh, familiar with Böhm Barberg. Uh, it is the essay of uh, Professor Eugen von Böhm Barberg. He was not only professor, but several times uh, Minister of Finance in the uh, Austrian, in the Habsburg Empire, and he wrote this article just be on the uh, uh, edge of First War, and the title is as instructive as provocative, power or economic uh, law, question mark, this Macht oder ökonomisches Gesetz. And he gave good examples that any politic against economic trends is running in a dead end uh, uh, way. Because money, and this is true up to today, money is our second uh, ballot paper, our second voting paper for people to direct uh, their fortune, their assets, and if there is a split in monetary uh, economics between money for to spend and money for to hold, then you have a clear-cut situation that the monetary system cannot win over politics. Because then happened what my young colleague was, was explaining, capital flight and capital flight and capital flight. Capital flight is one of the most important, I would say, Asyl uh, properties. I remember very well the time in Germany in the 30s when uh, the uh, 
Hitler regime stopped transfer payments abroad, many, many of our Jewish uh, uh, citizens uh, rejected to fly because they could not take the money with them. And this was one of the reasons uh, for the, for the uh, terrible figures of the Holocaust. So it's very important people have the right to vote with the money, and if they can do it, then uh, only dictatorship can, can uh, be uh, the, the political answer. Democracy has to accept the votum of, of capital flight, and I am very optimistic. This will be the reason in, in, in Europe too. Capital flight now from the countries in, in critical, critical situation to other currencies, but also to the more stable parts of the Eurozone still is running. What uh, Professor Bargos explained with the uh, new credits, target two of the Bundesbank to the European Central Bank, this is the expression not only of capital flight, but of reshuffling, reshuffling the capital coming from Greece, reshuffling back to Greece, which is a complete nonsense policy a complete nonsense policy because it's increasing uh, 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 the debts and it is counterproductive against uh, the uh, conditions of the support. So we have at the same time for the official rescue policy and conditions uh, an counter uh, element, namely the reshuffling of the capital flight. The expression we can see in the, in the balance sheets of the Bundesbank, more than 300 billion at, 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 at the moment. So the alternative we have to confront it with is can policy, even European policy, uh, be uh, formulated a long-term period against trends of the money markets and trends in the economy. And according Böhm Bawerk and his famous essay, it is only a limited period possible, a limited period possible, because uh, even reshuffling cannot uh, be done forever. So f the only uh, result of the uh, policy hitherto can be uh, compromised in the <laughs> sentence, the policy has bought time, but uh, did not know for what. So we need an answer to this question. Um, I've got a supplementary to that, but I'll hold on that because I know uh, Marta Andreas has a question. Uh, so, uh, Marta, would you like to uh, do the business? Thank you, Chair. Um, you spoke, Mr. Hankel, about the need to come back to the truth. I think the euro was built on a lie. And the real aim of bringing the Eurozone and the Euro was to promote a, a political union. I think the failure we have today is because probably the negotiation of the Constitution or the Lisbon Treaty delayed this political union and in the middle we, were, we suffered this crisis. So my question to you is, um, do you have any hope that the truth will prevail here in the European Union ever? The second thing you refer to is that we need investment. Well, um, for the last 20 years, Greece has received 60 billion of, uh, euros of funding from the European Union. Uh, can we trust the member states to invest? Because it, I gather that this 60 billion union were not invested or else Greece would not be in this terrible shape. And the third thing uh, is that both of you seem to say that the urgent way out is devaluation and default for the countries in trouble. And you state it as an example Argentina. Well, I happen to be born in Argentina. And I don't think Argentina is a success story. They devalued and defaulted. But the economy in Argentina has never grown. The middle class has been destroyed. So, you know, can we really consider this 
default and evaluation the solution. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, as an old man, I'm obliged to be optimistic. And I see one or two op optimistic scenario for a better uh, run of European policy. First, it's very optimistic, the learning capacity of politicians. Maybe they learn, and we do something in order to help them uh, to learn. But the other uh, <coughs> alternative is difficulties. The difficulties this policy is producing in relation to their uh, own goals and aims are irrefutable. They cannot overcome. So if uh, the situation is dragging out, is going out, capital flight from the south will be much more tremendous than the existing debts. We know a little bit what are the recorded debts, the public as well as the private. But this is nothing against the uh, liquidation of the savings in those countries. If they decide, more and more people decide to transfer their savings from Greece, Spain and Portugal and their banks to other banks in the north or in the United States or in, in New Zealand, then we get a next problem, not only consolidating debts, but to re-liquidate, re, um, liquidity, gave more liquidity uh, to the banks. And here, the ECB is becoming overchallenged. They cannot print money, money, money uh, without any limit. Then we get a problem with banks and from the banks with uh, states, and then the time I agree, uh, I, I think uh, people will agree we have to change government. The next three government, I'm convinced, have to stop this policy, and the best alternative to stop this policy is, is to opt out of the, of the union. It, gives, it would give uh, Greece the freedom to help themselves. And I think this is, in a medium term, the only perspective. And the open question is only, can uh, the Euro Union survive it? And I think there is no law. There is no law that the Union has containing all the 70 or 80, 19 uh, countries. It, it, it can live and it had to, be, uh, to live uh, with less countries but more stable. The Union is as stable as the countries are stable. Therefore, a reduction of the Union would be one practical uh, uh, outcome. And uh, reforming the union would be maybe the next step. But in this respect, I am optimistic too. A stabilized union with less countries but stable countries would be very attractive, very attractive for outsiders. Countries like Switzerland, the Scandinavian countries, Sweden, uh, Denmark, Norway, maybe also Russia. Therefore, we get a new formation in, in, in Europe. And the open question is what happened with the South, and here the South uh, has only the option uh, to live uh, with national currency to devalue and make national recovery programs in a more or less Keynesian way, which is possible. Yeah. Uh, can I have another question from the floor before I pop my question in? Tony up the back there. You set out in the end the sort of unpleasant combination of stagnation, inflation, centralization, and conflict. But actually, at least the first three of those are only a problem if you have democratic institutions and democratic government, which allows people uh, to respond to these unpleasantnesses. Isn't one of the advantages for the European Union that there is so little democracy in its central institutions that it can cope with these things and there is very little mechanism for the people to express 
their will and their disgust at what is happening. Yes, of, of course, uh, the Hood project was introduced already in a very undemocratic way, and I suppose that uh, the majority of the German population would be against continuing uh, the, this, uh, the, this project. So, yes, they can only continue with this, mostly because it's not what the people want. We saw it also in Slovakia yesterday uh, that... Uh, People, people are. I saw an interview of, 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 of people asked in the street, and they said, "Yeah, why should we pay for the richer, richer Greeks?" No. I agree completely with you. The open question is: Can a community live without democratic basic rights? And what we see in whole Europe even in North Africa, people are asking for the democratic rights. And uh, the first riots and the first demonstrations, even in Germany, are in preparation. People go on street and say, we want to uh, have a stable euro and we want to have uh, the Deutsche Mark back. I think this movement is beginning now and will, will rise and become uh, a stronger uh, river than uh, today. So let's wait for the next month. Uh, the gentleman here in the middle. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, sir. Uh, well, uh, my name is Ivo Strejcik. I'm a member of parliament uh, from the ECR group and from the Czech Republic as well. So fortunately, I'm from the country without the euro mm -hmm. and cherishing the Czech crown, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is doing doing good and better. Uh, well, <clears throat> my question is, uh, and must be, because formally we were in one country with Slovakia, so, so the Czechs understand the Slovaks uh, very well, and we understand the situation in Slovakia. Uh, what scares me, and uh, what I take as a, as a startling moment, is yesterday's fall of the Slovak government, which is associated with uh, voting in the parliament on the firewall. And uh, my question is quite simple, uh, and uh, I'd like uh, your comments. Uh, isn't one of bad consequences of the euro not only the economic, but, but the political one. Slovak, uh, Slovak government was center-right, quite reasonable government, and after yesterday's voting procedure in the parliament fell, which uh, will likely uh, mean that uh, socialist populist uh, from Slovakian political scene will get to power uh, what may happen next in uh, some other member states of the EU. So I would like to know your comments on it. Thank you. And a quick uh, supplementary on that, because it, I had that down myself. Um, is not political instability, uh, the natural progression of political instability, protectionism in some form? So, yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Yes, uh, it's very interesting to see how supposedly conservative governments do de destroy themselves on purpose. <laughs> or they, they, they don't care for what voters really want. But maybe we should not suppose that uh, in the democracies governments do what, what voters want in the, in the first place or what people re really want. So in Germany it's the same. Like Mer Merkel is uh, losing one election after the other, other the FDP also. Um, why do they do that? Well, because there are two options. Oh, they are really convinced part participants of this European project of uh, what they call Europe, what they mean as a European super state in, in uh, integration. Uh, and at the heart, they are socialists in this sense. So they are not conservatives at all. 
or they are also under the, or that is also true, they are under, str under strong pressure from lobby groups, uh, from in Germany exporters and uh, banks, uh, the financial sector, and and then also of course also the the for foreign politicians, like in the case of Slo Slovakia, that there's I suppose very strong pressure from from foreign countries. I associate myself. First of all, populism, always, in all times and in all cases, is the uh, <clears throat> follow-up of frustration. If policy is fr frustrating people, then uh, uh, populists have a good, good uh, soil and a good harvest. Therefore, it is a question of the uh, creditworthiness of policy. And in case of, of Slovakia, I can understand it very well. It's a very poor country and now urged to pay for a, a richer country, which is a case for frustration. Why? Why we should pay for people uh, who, who are richer than we and can do something for themselves. So why must help them? It's an over-challenging of solidarity. And this is, I think, the real problem in, in, in Europe now, with the rescuing of the euro. Uh, it is an over-stressing uh, of solidarity. Leftists in Germany, I couldn't understand it, uh, being in favor for a national welfare state, are for the euro, neglecting the fact that the money for the euro is missing for the welfare state. Same is true with the liberals. The liberals are for a free economy, but never realizing uh, that uh, rescue, uh, the euro is the beginning of a European centralized economic policy. So I think our first job and our common job, even in this room, is enlightening. We have to enlighten people about the real consequences of the euro and rescuing the, ru uh, the euro. Now we have the chance, due to this crisis, to change policy. So we must it, uh, do it now. Chain, uh, policy has to be changed because the rescuing of the uh, euro would bring us deeper and deeper in unsolvable situations. C can I uh, ask a question from the chair here, gentlemen? Um, which is a matter of some interest to not only to Ron Paul's department in the United States, but I've taken a bit of an interest in and this and got nowhere. And that is the subject of gold reserves. Philip, you mentioned gold reserves and, and, and backing currencies with gold and getting back to real money, all of which is, it seems to me to be fairly sensible. However, we have two questions here. One is why will not the Federal Reserve agree to an audit of their gold which hasn't been audited since 1972. What is that about? And secondly, I notice in the German, uh, German accounts, Professor, uh, that you have started to use the same column for bullion as you hold for bullion promissory notes in some form. And bullion and promissory notes or counterparty notes are not the same thing. Why has that changed? Is that just an accident? Because if it is an accident, I don't think I believe it. Where is the gold? Is it really there? It's a question for an economic detective. <laughs> Unfortunately, I am not a detective and have not the, the, the means of a uh, detective. But one thing is clear. <clears throat> Germany used its own billions decades ago for a more or less clever or non-clever policy, namely to uh, locate it in the United States as a uh, guarantee or as a substitute, better to say as a substitute for paying for American soldiers in Germany. This was a real beginning. We our central bank deposited uh, German gold reserves in Fort Knox, and the United States uh, freed then German government for paying more uh, for GIs, for American soldiers, to compensate the uh, expenditure 
of the occupation uh, uh, powers. Maybe Britain was involved in, 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 in the deal. I don't know precisely. But I know it uh, very well as a former civil servant. It was the, the, the background of an agreement between Bundesbank and Federal Reserve. So Germany freed by this deal uh, from compensations for uh, the expenditure for German GI. But what then happened, this is completely in the dark, completely in the dark. Even some questions in the Bundestag, in the German parliament, uh, were not be answered. Bundesbank was saying it's a secret of our banking business, and the uh, Minister of Finance said, I, I don't know nothing about it. <laughs> I, have, I haven't counted either the, the gold at the Fed or the, the Bundesbank, but one, is, one is, is clear that it's not in the interest neither of the Fed nor the ECB that the price of gold uh, increases. Right now, the ECB and the Fed are like inflating at the same level to finance um, their, 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 their governments, so they are depreciating at the same time. Uh, and as they are at the same time, at the same pace, you don't see it in the exchange rate between the two very much. But you can see it with gold. So uh, it is, of course, in the interest uh, that people don't see what is going on, don't see the inflation. And governments have had the, the, the luck that, um, for one reason, in the past 20 years, uh, China and India started to incorporate themselves in the International Division of Labor, and there was in tremendous growth, and also because of technological growth, so prices should have fallen, I don't know, 30 or 40 percent. They did not. But so people don't see, don't see, the, don't see, the, don't see the inflation, and the price of gold is, of course, a good si sign to indicate the inflation. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up because it's nosebag time and I need uh, lunch, I'm sure you do. It's been, I think, a very entertaining and a good session and uh, I hope you'll join with me in thanking the speaker.